talk of the morning sessions. Um, oh. Here we go. By Gurnit Atwal from the University of Toronto. And uh, he'll talk about a deep learning system. The, uh, he'll talk about the following paper. It's a sentence. A deep learning system can accurately classify primary amesthetic cancers based on patterns of messenger mutations. Looking forward to your talk. And this is the presenter for you. Thank you. Right, so uh, thank you for the introduction. And I'm going to talk about using mutations to identify cancer type. Uh, so cancer is a process of somatic evolution. And one of the most important events in the evolutionary history of a tumor is metastasis. So when a tumor metastasizes, some cells from the primary tumor gain the ability to migrate to and colonize some other organ in the body. Uh, and metastasis is the primary cause of cancer-related mor mortality, and it presents a major challenge in the clinic. Metastases contain uh, ancestral information about the primary tumor in the form of mutations that are found in the cells of the primary tumor that give rise to the metastasis. They typically contain additional mutations and often have a significant degree of phenotypic uh, divergence from the primary. And most of the time when a patient is diagnosed with metastatic cancer, it's really easy to figure out what the primary tumor is. But in about 3 to 5 percent of new cancer diagnoses, a patient presents with a metastatic tumor with no obvious primary, and this constitutes a carcinoma of unknown primary, and it accounts for roughly 40,000 new cases per year in North America. Because the primary tumors, tissue of origin, and histopathology are currently the strongest indicators of its clinical behavior, it's important to try and determine what the primary tumor site is. But studies that evaluate the ability for pathologists to determine primary tumor sites suggest that typically pathologists are unable to accurately identify the primary tumor site for carcinomas of unknown primary. Uh, and so given this obvious clinical need, it's uh, natural to wonder if we can use genomics to try and improve our ability to uh, diagnose these cases. And the natural choice for a genomics-based test is to use driver mutations. Uh, driver mutations are those mutations that are under positive selection. Uh, and people typically think of these as cancer-causing or cancer-propagating mutations. And they can very broadly be split into mutations to oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And there's some good reason to believe that uh, driver genes are good candidates. So uh, in this diagram, I'm just showing the classic model for the development of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And so you can see that pancreatic cancer develops through mutations to four cancer genes. So if you have an unknown tumor and you see these four mutations, you have some evidence that the cancer is pancreatic cancer. In addition, mutations carry ancestral information, so they provide information both about the metastasis and about the primary tumor. So based off of this, my colleague Wei Zhao at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research trained a random forest classifier to try and identify cancer type based off of mutations to driver genes and mutations in driver pathways. And what we found was uh, across 24 cancer types, driver genes and driver pathways are typically unable to accurately identify cancer type, suggesting that driver mutations are not a good feature for discriminating between different cancer types. Um, at the core, the problem of trying to identify cancer type is actually a problem of trying to identify cell type. And one of the defining features of cell type is chromatin. At a very, very high level, chromatin describes how DNA is packaged within a cell. And uh, when you think about it, essentially every cell in your body has approximately the same DNA, but phenotypically the cells in your brain, so that your neurons, are significantly different than uh, the cells that make up your skin. And these differences can be explained in part due to differences in chromatin state. Broadly, we can split chromatin into open or accessible regions and closed or inaccessible regions. And so if we had a way, for, a way to assay for chromatin features, we could develop some uh, machine learning model that will uh, identify cancer type. Unfortunately, chromatin tends to change due to a variety of different factors. And 
Unlike mutations, chromatin doesn't carry any ancestral information, and so it's not clear whether assaying the chromatin state of a, a, metastat, a metastatic sample will actually provide any information about the primary tumor. Fortunately, we may be able to use mutation density as a proxy for chromatin state. And so here I'm just showing a figure from a paper from 2015. And the x-axis is just chromosomal coordinates for chromosome 2. The blue line represents the degree of closed chromatin in one megabase regions. And the black lines uh, represent the number of C to T mutations aggregated across all melanoma samples in TCGA. And the really striking thing about this figure is that there's a very high correlation between uh, the black and blue lines. Wherever there's an increase in mutation density, there tends to be an increase in the degree of closed chromatin. And this tells us that uh, mutations either occur more frequently or are repaired less frequently in regions of closed chromatin. It also tells us that mutation density encodes some information about chromatin state. And because mutation density provides information about chromatin state and it contains ancestral information about the primary tumor, it may be a useful feature for trying to identify cancer type. We can uh, identify or find more information about cancer type looking, uh, by looking at mutational exposures, which were covered in great detail in the previous talk, so I'm not going to uh, go through them uh, very deeply. But a good example of where a mutational exposure can tell us something about cancer type is signature four, uh, the smoking or tobacco-related signature. Uh, if you have a tumor of unknown origin and it has a high amount of signature 4, you have some evidence that it's lung cancer. Uh, there are other carcinogens where this relationship holds, such as the signature for UV damage. If you have a high amount of UV damage, you have some reason to believe that the tumor is melanoma. And so uh, returning back to our problem of trying to identify the cell type or the, the tumor type of origin for carcinoma of unknown primary, what we aimed to do was uh, train a neural network based on primarily patterns of somatic pasture mutations to try and identify uh, cancer type. In order to train our classifier, we used data from the pan-cancer analysis of whole genomes, or PCOG. PCOG has collected whole genome sequencing of about 2,800 cancer samples from 39 different cancer types. And for this work, I restricted myself to 24 common cancer types, each with at least 36 unique donors in PCOG. I derived features from our mutations in two different ways. The first is what I'm going to refer to as the mutation distribution. And this corresponds to the mutation density uh, features I described a couple slides ago. And to construct these features, uh, we basically just take the genome, we fuse each of the chromosomes head to tail, and then we split the genome into one megabase uh, bins. In each of these bins, we count the number of single nucleotide variants, and we throw out all other information about the mutations, so functionally, they're all the same. And we also included information about mutational exposures in the form of mutation types, and so we just use the normalized counts of the different uh, trinucleotide contexts uh, in which mutations occur. As uh, many of you know, selecting hyperparameters for deep neural networks is very important, but it's also uh, incredibly frustrating. And uh, in order to do this in an efficient way, I used a Bayesian optimization procedure. Uh, briefly, you can approximate smooth functions with Gaussian processes. And so Bayesian optimization uh, approximates a neural network's performance as a function of hyperparameters with a Gaussian process. We can then optimize some acquisition function, which will tell us where to next uh, sample hyperparameters. We sample hyperparameters, create our neural network, train and evaluate the network, and then we can use the performance to update our Gaussian process. When we do this in an iterative manner, it allows us to more efficiently search the space of uh, hyperparameter combinations. And for this work, we uh, used a cross-validation approach where we split our data into 10 different train validation and test, set, test sets. And for each of these sets, we used Bayesian optimization to select hyperparameters. And at the end, this left us with 10 fully trained 
neural networks, which we used as an ensemble uh, in downstream tasks. So here I'm just showing uh, performance for uh, three, of the, uh, three of the models that we work with. The first is a random forest model trained on the mutation distribution, mutation type features. And this model was trained uh, as, was used as our best possible baseline. Uh, we have the best performing model, which was also trained on those features, but it was a uh, 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 deep learning model. And we trained this additional model where, uh, in addition to the mutation distribution and mutation types, I added uh, explicit information about which driver genes or pathways were altered. And so the main takeaways here are that uh, the model trained just on mutation distribution and mutation types was the best performing model. And that when we add information about driver mutations, we actually see a slight decrease in uh, the model's overall performance, suggesting that at the very least, our features that are um, derived predominantly from past year mutations are sufficient for identifying cancer type. So uh, this is a confusion matrix for uh, the best 10 models, and it's averaged across all 10 of those models. The predictions from the networks are on uh, the x-axis, and the true cancer type is on the y-axis. The overall uh, accuracy of the classifier was 91%, which is roughly uh, double that of a trained pathologist when given a similar task. Uh, 20 of the 24 cancer types were classified with an F1 score of at least 0.8. And when the network makes misclassifications, they're often explainable due to uh, common patterns of mutational exposures or common cell types of origin. The, the best example of this is highlighted here for stomach cancer and esophageal cancer. The networks consistently misclassify these two cancers. Um, they have common patterns of mutational exposures. They have common developmental origins. And there are a small number of misdiagnoses due to tumors that arise in the gastroesophageal junction. We see a similar pattern of misclassifications for the two B cell malignancies. Um, these are also cancers that arise from the same cell type of origin, just at different developmental stages. And the original version of this work actually had these two cancer types grouped as one, uh, but that didn't go over very well with the reviewers. And so you can see that the model uh, tends to misclassify these two cancers, and once again, this is an explainable misclassification. Uh, despite this, the, the model does quite well with some highly related tumor types. A really good example is classification of glioblastoma and pyeloastrocytoma. These, these are both tumors that arise uh, from glial cells in the brain, and the classifier essentially never mistakes uh, these two cancer types. And we can see uh, similar patterns for classification of kidney chromophobe carcinoma and renal cell carcinoma, and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas. Uh, because we're using real data, there's a large distribution in, the, in terms of the number of samples available for each cancer type. And I wanted to see if this explains some of the, the differences in performance. And so basically every cancer with at least 150 samples was classified very well. Uh, we also tend to see good performance for some of the cancer types with very few uh, examples. And a really good uh, example of this is glioblastoma which had 41 unique donors in PCOG, but was uh, classified with an F1 score greater than 0.9. Despite this, we do see some decrease uh, in performance for some cancer types, such as stomach adenocarcinoma. Uh, and given that stomach cancer is so highly related to esophageal cancer, it's possible that if we had more examples of this cancer type, the networks would be able to uh, find features that would uh, better differentiate these highly related tumor types. Uh, here I'm showing another confusion matrix, and this is for the model where we added information about driver mutations. So the big takeaway here is, uh, as I mentioned before, the overall accuracy drops by a couple of percent, but we see uh, increases in performance for certain cancer types. A good example is melanoma, where uh, the classifier now identifies melanoma correctly perfectly, and uh, my feeling is that including information explicitly about BRAF mutations, which are very common in melanoma, uh, 
result in a slight increase. The really interesting case is actually a pyloastrocytoma, which was previously classified very poorly, but when we add information about driver mutations, it's almost always identified correctly. I thought this was kind of strange, and when I looked at the data, it turns out that pyloastrocytomas, in PCOG at least, almost always lack driver mutations. And so my feeling is that the network is actually learning this lack of driver mutations as a feature for identifying this cancer type. Uh, of course, the goal of this project is to try and identify the primary tumor for metastases. And we are fortunate to receive data from uh, about 2,000 metastatic tumors from the Hartwig Medical Foundation in the Netherlands, and an additional 200 metastatic pancreatic cancer samples from Steve Gallinger at the uh, Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And so despite the fact that these samples were uh, biopsied in a completely different manner, uh, sequenced using a different protocol, uh, analyzed using a different mutation calling pipeline, and that almost all of the metastatic cancers had been sequenced following treatment, the classifier that was trained solely on mutations from primary tumors was able to identify uh, the primary tumor for these metastases with an accuracy of about 83%. Uh, and whenever we gave it uh, cancer types with uh, more than 100 samples, the classifier did quite well, suggesting that some but not all of the misclassifications uh, are due to uh, sampling bias. And so just to uh, summarize, uh, we have trained this uh, neural network based primarily on passengers of somatic mutations that can accurately discriminate between 24 common cancer types. Uh, it has immediate clinical applicability in determining the, cell, the primary tumor of origin for carcinomas of unknown primary, and we're exploring different avenues for moving this into a clinic. And in doing so, we uh, had this kind of interesting side result that adding information about driver mutations didn't uh, improve our classification performance suggesting that there's enough cell type specific information in pasture mutations. And some future work, as I mentioned, we want to move this into a clinic, and in a clinical setting, it's important to represent uncertainty in a principled way, so I'm exploring different Bayesian deep learning methods to do so. In addition, the classifier only works for 24 common cancer types, and I'm working on using few shot learning to extend this to less common cancer types. With that, I uh, want to thank my supervisors, Quaid Morris and Gary Bader, all of my collaborators, especially Wei Zhao and Paz Polak. I want to give a special mention to two super talented undergrads who are working with me on related work, uh, Jacob and Connor. And I uh, thank the Ontario Institute for uh, Cancer Research and the Vector Institute for uh, supporting my work. And th Good. Thank you. Thank you for your talk and uh, time for questions. Yes, please. Thanks, that was a really nice talk. I was curious about when you were looking at the uh, chromatin accessibility and windowing the genome, uh, you counted up the, uh, the number of mutations, but you removed the type of mutations, if I've understood, understood correctly. Um, can you just explain that? I didn't quite understand why you got rid of that information. Um. Because whole genome sequencing data is like for tumors is relatively difficult to find, we faced some dimensionality constraints. So if I expanded uh, those features to include counts of the different, say, trinucleotide variants or uh, some, something like that, we ended up in a domain where we just didn't have enough data to effectively learn a, a good representation that could classify uh, the cancer types. So do you have a feeling about whether that would improve uh, your prediction ability if, if you did have that data and you were able to keep the, the type as well as the position in the genome? Uh, I don't think it would uh, reduce performance at the very least because we, we do add information about the mutation types just kind of appended to the end of the, the, the mutation distribution vector. I suspect that it would actually improve performance, especially if we had enough samples that we could reduce the one megabase uh, boundaries to something smaller because there is, there are finer scales of features that describe mutation rate that are related to chromatin features. So nucleosome positioning, 
uh, and stuff, and just specific histone marks have some relationship between the types of mutations and the number of mutations that occur in a region. And so I suspect that if we could expand, uh, uh, or sorry, reduce the window size and add in this, the, the information about mutation types, we'd actually improve performance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Could we have time for one more quick question? Interesting talk. So I'm uh, wondering how much of the classification power uh, from the signatures actually comes from the age of the patient. Because, for example, GBM is developed later in the life, and uh, PA in the CNS tumors is more like early in the life. And uh, did you look at other covariates as well? Uh, so we didn't look at other covariates. I suspect that the reason the network uh, almost always differentiates uh, GBM from pyelastrocytoma is uh, due to the age of the patient and the fact that pediatric tumors are, have reduced mutation burden. Uh, we tended not to look at other covariates because in general most of the, the donors were over the age of 50 uh, and uh, it was difficult to, to uh, analyze covariates and then try consider different methods for actually incorporating them uh, back into the model. So did you look at a signature one if uh, it's a very high weight in the classification between the two? Um, so I'm just going to... Right, so Jacob, who's the undergrad in the lab, used a method called deep lift to try and determine feature importance for uh, the different input features for classification. And so in general, uh, this is a distribution of the top uh, 200, I believe, or 300 uh, most important features, and in general mutation type, so what would uh, be signature one, is not explicitly uh, the defining feature for any of the cancer types, but part of that is due to the fact that mutation type and mutation distribution are not perfectly independent features, and most mutations are going to be from mutation one, unless they're hypermutated tumors, and most mutations are going to follow this uh, chromatin state driven pattern. And so it's hard to actually tease out uh, features like that when looking at a, a, a deep neural network. Okay, thank you. I would like to move to next. Is it a very short, short, very short one? Depending on his answer. Okay, <laughs> can you answer that? <laughs> I'm kidding. So, Please, okay, let's do it. Uh, hi, you have shown that uh, model performance decreased when you, in, uh, when you included the driver mutation information. Do you kind of explain a bit more because Driver mutations are kind of specific to each cancer type, right? So uh, I'll say this quickly. Most driver, mu driver mutations have a, a long tail. Uh, there's like a small set of driver mutations that are common across a large number of cancers. And then there's like this large number of driver mutations that are like cancer specific in the sense that they're present in like a quarter of one specific cancer type. And in addition, uh, if we had more data, I suspect that the models would uh, perform equally because it would learn when driver mutations are not important at all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, and thank you to all speakers of the morning sessions. I enjoyed it very much.